Hello there, and welcome to Preprints in Motion, a podcast taking a deep dive in the fast-paced world of preprints. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers, discuss their latest preprint, and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. Hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, and find us on Twitter at MotionPod. Support us by heading over to buymeacoffee.com slash preprints. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we've got Bray Biggie, a PhD student, or rather now postdoc in Pratchiavasti's lab, uh, Viva was the day before this episode comes out, so congratulations, Bray, or Dr. Biggie. So the okay. first question, uh, nice and easy, is could you introduce yourself and sort of what you do? Yeah, yeah. So my name is Bray Biggie. I'm a graduate student in Pratyavasti's lab. I'm a fifth year, so I'm sort of getting ready to finish up, um, and I'm at Dartmouth College. And so I study the model organism Chlamydomonas reinhardii, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, as we go on, and I'm interested in cilia and also like cytoskeletal regulation. I am never going to pronounce clim- chlamydia. To, it's Chlam- you can call it clammy. That's <laughs> fine. That's what everyone calls it that works with it. <laughs> no, uh, and and fifth year PhD student always blows my mind because I think I forget how long it is for you guys in the US doing a PhD. We do. We we, we get three years and out. Wow, that's crazy. Well, our first year we are in like classes and then rotations and stuff. So I don't know that that really counts, but it's my fourth year, I guess, in the lab. Yeah. But it is still a long time. Four (laughs) years. We're out. Three years and your funding's done. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) And then you, yeah, you use a lot of panicking. So you give us so many fun facts. I think Emma got a little bit confused as to which one to use um, because she just started off the hill to shoot the top with baking and kayaking and hiking are cool. Um, I mean, they are all cool. So is the fact that you have a dog with a human name. I love that. Yeah, Amy. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the show Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but we named her after one of the main characters in that show. (laughs) We were planning to get a boy dog, so we were going to name him Captain Holt and then call him Captain, but we ended up with a girl, so we went with the second best, which is Amy. (laughs) I Shouting Captain across the field would be amazing. (laughs) Yeah, almost as good as like shouting Amy across the field when there's... (laughs) Amy's around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a good way to make friends, right? Dogs help you do yeah. that anyway. If your dog also has the same name as the person you're trying to make friends with. That works. <laughs> Great. Uh, and the other thing that we'll definitely come back to towards the end is that you moved cross country, not only mid PhD, but mid pandemic. I'm not mm-hmm. entirely sure you understood what fun meant when we asked for a fun <laughs> fact, because I, I don't think that counts as fun. Yeah, it wasn't exactly fun, but it, I guess it was fun getting to like explore a new place and um, do all these things that I wouldn't have gotten to do if we would have stayed, which like kayaking and hiking, we don't have a lot of that in Kansas, but there's a ton in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, you're making me jealous of not living in Vermont. <laughs> I, so I, I also moved, uh, not mid PhD, I moved at the mid sort of postdoc and mid pandemic. Mm-hmm. But I moved from Cambridge to London, which uh, that's an hour away on the train. Oh. <laughs> Tiny distance. Um, okay, so I think we can get into it. So your paper focuses on ciliary length. Ciliary is another word that's going to get me through this one. Um, <laughs> oh, we choose them. We choose them well. So could you just give us a little bit of background about what cilia are and why it's important to study them? Yeah, so cilia are these sort of ubiquitous organelles that are expressed in a a bunch of different organisms. They're on almost every cell of the human body. And so you can imagine that they're very important um, and they're used for sensing the environment. Um, So they have a lot of like different um, receptors on them that help sense the environment. Um, And they can also be important for moving. So an example of that is like in the trachea, you have these multiciliated cells that help you kind of move your mucus up and down. And then in chlamydomonas or clammy, they use them to actually swim through the media. Um, so they're really important for sensing and motility. And like I said, they're expressed kind of everywhere. So um, defects in cilia can cause a collective kind of term of diseases that's called ciliopathies. And these are just any sort of diseases that have defects in cilia um, in humans. And so that makes them really important to understand. Yeah. And so all cilia are kind of the, like the main composition of them is that they have this microtubule axoneme that extends through the middle of the cilia. Um, so that's a, diff- a type of cytoskeletal protein um, and it makes these sort of long tubules and those kind of make up the core of the of the cilia and then it's surrounded by a plasma membrane which is contiguous with the cell body plasma membrane but there's um, some like gating stuff at the bottom that makes it so that they're not necessarily like super contiguous. 
So cilia, they're found basically everywhere, right, in biology, because they're on single cells right up to, like you said, multi-organisms like us. Mm -hmm. In terms of the diseases, are there any particularly big, bad diseases with this, or does it tend to cause mild... I'd imagine it's quite varied. Yeah, it, I think it varies a lot. Um, they're, like, if the ones in your trachea, if you have problems with that, you can have a lot of, like, um, respiratory issues. There are kidney diseases that um, stem from defects with cilia. Um, one kind of interesting one is, um, I always forget what it's called, but the disease where like your organs are on the wrong side of your body, that oh, yeah. can stem from a ciliopathy. Oh. Um, so there's some some big ones and then probably some smaller ones too. I did not know that. Always learning, always learning. <laughs> so, so could you talk about what this uh, clammy is like as a model and how you use it? Because we, we do a lot of one of the big things we have about this show is we love to choose papers with pretty pictures in it, um, mm -hmm. which is just great for an audio medium. We really, really chose our <laughs> medium well there. Um, but you're, you, you've got one of those preprints where you've got uh, some really cool pictures in there. Uh, the little thing you've got where it's a circle, uh, which I guess is the tracks rather than an actual image. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is that's really pretty. That's the kind of thing I get tattooed <laughs> on my arm, actually. Um, so, you know, ha, ha, what are these like to work with? Yeah, Clammy are a great model system. And this is something that I sort of considered even when I chose a lab because a lot of my friends went into do like mouse work and stuff. And I know that that can take like months, even years to get exactly what you need. Um, and then even just the experiments can take forever. But with Clammy, they grow overnight. So we can start a culture on like a Monday night and do an experiment on Tuesday, which is really great. They also, because they're single celled, it's a lot simpler system than some of the like more complex models that um, exist, um, which makes it, I think, easier to or easier to sort of dig into the biology. So, um, they have a fully sequenced genome, which is really handy. And then one of the really cool things about Clammy is that we have this resource called the Clammy Mutant Library, where um, researchers have developed mutants for like 80% of the Clammy genome. So you can just order a mutant and then, like, you know, like genotype it and phenotype it. Yeah, so that makes things really a lot easier and it's a really great resource. And I guess, so you mentioned the images, and so that is phylloidin staining, so to look at the filamentous actin. And it's kind of a cool story because we haven't always been able to do filamentous actin staining in Clammy um, super well. Um, and actually only in 2019 did we get phylloidin staining working in these cells, um, and it was kind of an uphill battle. So that was kind of cool, but now it's like my favorite thing to take take images of, so. <laughs> actin staining is, it's such a simple stain really, but it's, it's always beautiful. It's never not yeah. beautiful down a microscope. <laughs> yeah. why, why was it so difficult to get it to work? Um, so we think it's kind of a combination of things. One of the problems that we do have with Clammy as a model is that it's a photosynthetic organism. So it has chloroplast and so they have sort of their own fluorescence. Um, and so we deal a lot with autofluorescence. And I think it also might have just had to do with like the differences in the actins that we're looking at. Like in Chlamydomonas, they're a little bit different than they are in humans. Um, so basically what we did was we cut like the incubation time down for the phylloidin and uh, made sure that we had really fresh like fixative solution um, and a lot of washes. And eventually we kind of we kind of got to what we were looking for. And then also it's kind of helped like we've we started out with a wide field fluorescence microscope and deconvolution, which helped a lot. But now we're on to using like a spinning disk microscope. And then in my paper, I use an airy scan microscope. Um, and so that provided some really great images. Yeah, we got uh, towards the end of my PhD, we got an airy scan and it was just beautiful. Not yeah. just because it was a new <laughs> microscope, but uh, and spinning disk is what I spent most of my PhD sat on uh, yep. next to you, sat next to you. <laughs> So what, what are these like to actually culture? So they're quick to culture, but I, are you growing them like you would with any other cells, just in a dish with meter on top? Yeah, so we maintain them on like a, an agar plate, which is um, tap. So just like sort of like, like bacteria. Um, and then if we want to do an experiment, we'll put them into liquid media and then that just grows overnight. And it's, it's really cool because everything's super green because they're like half plant. Mm. Um, so all of our all of our cultures are green. Um, oh, and we grow them under light because they're photosynthetic. So we always have light on in the lab. So everyone will, like point to our windows and be like, there's the purple lab because our lights are on <laughs> for, the, for the clammy growing. <laughs> yeah, but then we can also grow like much larger stocks of it. So mm. I've grown up like liters and stuff and that's, that's also doable, so. I think you might be the first sort of. person I've spoken to who doesn't just pipette colorless liquids around them. You can actually see what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> 
great. So, so one of the other things you mentioned was that this is just one of the models you can look at for looking at uh, cilia. Why this model? Is it just because it is accessible and easy to grow? Um, that's part of it. Another thing that makes clammy a really great model for cilia is that the cilia of clammy, even though they are like so far away from humans, the cilia are really like structurally and mechanistically conserved. So they do sort of the same things. They look sort of the same if you look at the like ultra structures. Um, and so it's just a really good model because it's simpler, it's easier, um, but it shows you something that's conserved in mammalian cells. Yeah, that was, that's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. <laughs> so could, we've, I, I'm spending more time than I usually do on the background because it's a new organism and it got me that's excited. Okay. <laughs> um, so so maybe, we, maybe we should, at this point, talk about what you've actually done in the study. Um, so, so could you give us a little overview of what you did and what you found? Yeah, so um, one of the things that people studying cilia um, like to do is kind of mess with the regulation of ciliary length to sort of better understand it. And we, there are tons of studies out there where people shorten ciliary length and look at, you know, what's causing that, why are they shorter, that sort of thing. But there aren't as many studies if you turn the dial the other way and lengthen cilia. And one way that sort of works to do this is treating the cells with lithium. And this kind of ubiquitously, like across organisms, across cell types makes cilia elongate. And so in clammy, they grow like they grow to like one and a half length, which is really cool. Um, and so we were sort of interested in understanding like what the mechanistic sort of background is behind this. And so we know that the cilia are composed of the microtubule core and then also the plasma membrane that goes around it. And we sort of have some evidence from our previous paper that there might be some something involving the plasma membrane that's sort of um, helping regulate ciliary length a little bit. Um, and so we looked at where this that where the membrane was coming from for this ciliary elongation in lithium. And so we kind of ruled out the Golgi and found that endocytosis is important for the elongation of cilia. Um, without proper endocytosis, they can't elongate in lithium. And then we also went on to find that this is dependent on actin and the ARP2-3 complex, which is also sort of consistent with what we've seen previously. We mentioned the phylloid, and so we show these actin puncta that kind of form near the base of the cilia that we think are endocytic pits. Um, and so sort of like bringing it all together, we think that there's some sort of um, ARP2-3 dependent endocytic process that's involved in regulating ciliary length through membrane recruitment. And is that, do you think that's the same mechanism as what happens when people are shortening it? Or is this, do you think this is a totally different mechanism? That's a good question. We have those every now and then. <laughs> Um, I think that there are probably a lot of things that are regulating ciliary length. So I don't at all think that it's just this mechanism. Um, so I think maybe some of those mechanisms that are causing shortening ciliary length could involve this. So an example of that is um, we also study, or my other paper is on the RP3 complex and its role in ciliary assembly um, and maintenance. And if I put on CK666, which is a drug that blocks um, RP3 complex function, the cilia will shorten. So they do end up shorter. And I think that is probably related to this, um, but others could be related to other things too. And why why is it you use lithium? Is lith I assume lithium's not toxic to them. Actually, um, after about 90 minutes with lithium on them, they kind of, the cilia kind of start to crash out. Um, okay. They shed their cilia um, and eventually I think that they do die in lithium, but it, we're sort of inter interested in that like acute period right. um, and understanding what's happening to make the cilia elongate. Um, but the reason that we, that we use lithium is just because it's something that, it's one of the few things that can like ubiquitously lengthen cilia and it's an acute perturbation. Like we have different mutants that have lung flagella, but that's not so much an acute perturbation. It's something that is more chronic because it's a mutation instead of a drug. Okay. And could, so could you, well, presumably you can, get access to that, that library of cool knockouts and models you said? And I mean, mm -hmm. have, you, have you done that or is that a next step? Um, and then like test if they're susceptible to lithium. Yeah. Um, that's something that would be really cool. And I think it's actually something that Prachi even tried to do back in her postdoc. Um, I'm not exactly sure what happened there, but that would be a really cool next step to sort of see if you could piece, like, pick out more sort of players in this pathway that way. And how does all of this relate to things like wound healing and repair? So my, my, old, my PhD lab, we used to work on a lot of wound repair in Drosophila. And I know my boss had a paper looking at um, the ARP stuff in, in that realm of wound repair. So I assume this must have quite an important role 
in Rune Repair? Because it's all about building up Acton, so. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's something I haven't, really, haven't really connected. They've all been great, but that's something <laughs> I haven't really connected, I guess, wound healing in this, but I imagine that it would be important because like there's a lot of sensing and then like endocytosis and that sort of thing going on in wound healing. So I imagine that it would be a really important process. And what is the endocytosis actually doing? Why is it important that you have endocytosis to lengthen ciliary? So yeah, we think that, so at the base of the cilia, I mentioned that the plasma membrane of the cilia and the plasma membrane of the cell are contiguous, um, but at the bottom of the cilia, you have this region called the diffusion barrier, which is composed of septins. And um, so you can't necessarily just like laterally diffuse stuff into the cilia. Um, and so we kind of reasoned that perhaps you also can't just like lat lat laterally diffuse membranes. So we thought maybe you have to bring the membrane in. And so we think that the endocytosis is important for sort of reclaiming um, some of the membrane from the plasma membrane and bringing it to the cilia in a manner that's like too fast for new proteins to be synthesized and then trafficked through the ER and the Golgi and everything to get to cilia. So we think it's sort of for like rapid assembly or elongation um, to bring in membrane for elongation. So recycling in action then. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're, I haven't stuck to any of Emma's questions, she's going to be so happy. <laughs> um, when you're building these out, is it that the tubule part goes first and then the plasma membrane surrounds that or do you build out the plasma membrane first i imagine that makes more sense that's a that's a also a really good question so many good Front questions fire. <laughs> um and also i'm not sure that it's like fully known i think so the centro centrosomes will come in and dock to the plasma membrane and then start assembling the cilium and you get sort of like a little like a little hump in the membrane um but then i think you have, probably have to bring in more membrane to like rapidly assemble that so i guess i'm not sure that it's fully known what happens first and what comes next and that sort of thing but i think that membrane would be really important early on also from my previous paper where we're looking at arp 23 mediated ciliary assembly um in my arp 23 mutant cells um that are lacking a functional arp 23 complex and then therefore don't have this like membrane recycling pathway they don't grow cilia at all for like the first two hours so we think that it's important also for like the very early mm. stages of assembly where you know you're just starting to grow your cilia so i think they're probably both important and maybe happening around the same time i'm glad you mentioned arp 23 because that, that makes my segue to my next question much easier <laughs> um so how, how is arp 23 involved in this whole process uh, and what is it, it doing the RP3 complex is an actin nucleator, um, so it helps create new filamentous actin networks in the cell. And in um, like mammalian cells, it's been really extensively studied and found to be involved in a lot of membrane remodeling functions, which is kind of how we made the sort of leap to membrane. So it's involved in things like forming lamellipodia and in endocytosis and other cells. But it hasn't really been extensively studied in clammy. Um, I think this is actually the or my previous paper is like the first paper on our 2 3 complex in clammy. And so we sort of first actually found that the RP23 complex was required for ciliary assembly. And then from that, we sort of like found that it was important for assembling these actin puncta that we think look like endocytic pits. And then from that, we found it was required for endocytosis um, and then sort of like merge that into this um, sort of pathway that we're proposing. So how does it fit in with the GSK3 that's in your nice little model at the end of this preprint? Yeah, that's a that's also a really good question. So oh. um, <laughs> so we think that lithium is inhibiting GSK3, um, which is somehow just triggering this burst of endocytosis that's going to bring in a lot of membrane for ciliary assembly. Um, and we know that the ARP23 complex is required for that endocytosis. So in the case of like the ARP23 mutants, which don't grow or which don't elongate their cilia in lithium, we think like GSK3 is then triggering endocytosis, but endocytosis can't occur because it doesn't have the ARP23 complex to help like bring in those like um, endocytic pits. Do you, uh, this might be a hard question. I don't know. Obviously to, to recycle, you've, you've got to deform the pits at the, the edges where you're taking plasma membrane from. What I mean is, is that deforming kicking off the process of building out again? Or is that building out resulting in the deformation and endocytosis? Oh, of, of the cilia? Yeah. yeah. Um, there we go. We, I got there in the end. <laughs> I also, I haven't really thought about that before either. I think it's probably a little, I think it's probably more like a signaling pathway where like the, maybe the deformation of the membrane is like 
promoting some sort of signaling cascade that's then turning on endocytosis to bring in more. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, I think this is why we stick to a script. Um, <laughs> so with the clammy, how do they know that they need to grow the cilia out? Is it, is it that they're sensing damage? Because, I mean, presumably they get to a certain length and then stop growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do they know when to stop? Because this sounds like a very active dynamic process. I'm trying to think of where the brakes are. Yeah, that is sort of like the whole question behind ciliary length regulation is how do they know when to stop? And there have been a ton of models proposed for how the cilia know how long to grow. Um, and I talk about them a little bit in the discussion of this paper, but I think there's models that are like based on diffusion of different aspects of the cilia, like the tubulin itself or other proteins that are involved. There's sort of the, the balance point model, which is pretty widely um, accepted that you have sort of ciliary elongation occurring, but you also have recycling at the tip. So you have you have assembly and disassembly sort of happening at the same time, but eventually they'll reach a balance point and mm. that's like the length that cilia want to be. And so that that's sort of like the big question that we're kind of trying to get at here. And I don't know that I mean, I don't think my work at all answers that, but I think that it could lead to like helping answer that sometime in the future. In terms of at least like membrane availability, there are a lot of models about protein availability, but not not a lot really focused on membrane. What's your favorite model? What do you think is going on? <laughs> I really like the balance point model for for like protein availability. I think it makes a lot of sense and I think it has a lot of um, support. Um, from sort of like a lot of the experiments that have been done. But I still think that we're pretty far off from like fully understanding what's happening. Have you looked at um, pro oh, well, protein or gene levels of all these things you mentioned to see if sort of what their levels are and whether they're being upregulated or not? Yeah, um, I haven't personally in this paper looked at protein levels or gene levels or anything, but there is a paper that I can't remember the authors, but there is a paper that looks at protein expression um, with lithium and they find that like tubulin and a few other things are upregulated. Um, so there is protein um, synthesis happening. But in my paper and in a previous paper um, by another group, we found that treating the cells with cyclohexamide, which inhibits protein synthesis, doesn't necessarily inhibit ciliary elongation in lithium. So I don't know if it's required for the elongation, but it seems like there is like a kick in in protein synthesis mm. after lithium treatment. I have a question that just come to me that is purely out of selfish interest. <laughs> um, I'm going to do the classical conference speaker asking a question thing. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm quite interested in cellular metabolism and mm -hmm. how immune cells sort of change how they use their metabolism to do the different functions. So because these have chloroplasts in them, how does that impact things here? Because presumably they need a bit more energy to do this kind of behavior. So, I mean, can you change the numbers of chloroplasts and see how that affects things i'm just i'm going all out there with the question <laughs> um so the way that clammy are sort of structured they have actually one large like cup shaped chloroplast okay. that takes up like most of the cell and so i don't know that we could necessarily like change the number of chloroplasts so we could probably there are probably different mutants that you could use to like change the like efficiency of energy consumption or creation or whatever. And we haven't looked at that, but I also think that like this particular lithium treatment is happening on a pretty short time scale. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much, like how much effect it would have on something that like chloroplast that takes longer. Um, but I haven't like noticed any large abnormalities with chloroplast because like I said, they sometimes autofluoresce. So mm -hmm. sometimes we can see them and then we, we can also see them when we look at like DIC imaging. And so I haven't seen any like major defects or anything, but that would be interesting. Yeah, no, just pure. Asking a question at a conference. Yeah. Also, I guess another thing is that the cilia are like a tiny percentage of the cell. And this mm. is something that I always forget, but like they're super skinny, they're tiny. Um, and so I don't know how much of an effect like that is going to have on a larger process of like, like photosynthesis or something. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the overall aim with this kind of research? What are your, are you hoping to just discover how biology works or are you hoping to <laughs> eventually lead to something that is used in the clinic? So I think it's kind of a little bit of both. I actually kind of came into this because I'm interested in actin regulation. And so I came in studying the ARP23 complex because I thought it was cool. Um, and it sort of led into this sort of more complicated process of studying cilia and how they're regulated and everything. And I think eventually, very far down the road, that could lead to something useful. Um, 
for studying like those ciliopathies that I mentioned before. But I also I'm, I'm super interested in just like basic biology and sort of pushing the field further um, through some of these experiments. I was trying to bring it full circle, then I've just got another question in my head. <laughs> so it's not very often we have someone where we can talk about a pay, a, a two preprints sort of that are carrying on the work. So what's next? Where's where, are you are, are you done with two, or are you going for the trilogy? <laughs> I actually have another paper also that um, <laughs> you're going for so the my... trilogy. <laughs> so my like I came into the lab to study actin, which I said before, and so my very first thing that I wanted to do was see if the ARP23 complex could interact with Chlamydomonas actin, because clammy actually have two separate actin genes. They have one that's conventional; it's like 91 percent similar to mammalian actin, and then they have one that is more divergent, and it's like 60 some percent identical to mammalian actin. So they have these, so they have a conventional and a divergent actin in the same organism. And so I wanted to see if the ARP23 complex could interact with the conventional and the divergent actin. Um, and so that's sort of um, how I started this project. And I have some data to support that the ARP23 complex can interact with both, despite like the large um, sequence divergence of the secondary divergent actin. Um, and so hopefully I'll at least preprint that paper before I defend. Um, and then I have these two. And then hopefully based on like this work, some more work is done to sort of understand what actin and the ARP23 complex are doing in ciliary assembly and length regulation and everything. I've got more questions now. Um, <laughs> why, why are there two different actins? What, what's the other one doing? especially with it being such a small amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the conventional actin, which is Ida5, is the one that is generally expressed in these cells. Um, and then there's the secondary actin, NAP1, it's divergent, and it's like expressed at really negligible levels during normal conditions. But we have found that if you depolymerize the, de or depolymerize the conventional actin, Ida5, you get upregulation of the divergent actin, NAP1 or the secondary actin. And so it can compensate for a lot of the cellular functions of that first actin. So we think it might just be like a compensatory um, sort of thing. But um, we aren't really sure beyond that what exact, why it has to or what exactly it's doing. But that's something that would be really cool to figure out. Okay, I'm going to stop asking science questions. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here forever. <laughs> Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint service, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. So we ask everyone whose decision was it to preprint? Why you did you preprint? But I don't imagine you had a lot of choice in the matter, <laughs> considering whose lab you're in. Yeah, it was. I sort of just like knew from the beginning that we would preprint, <laughs> but that was okay with me because it was also something that I really wanted to do. I was actually just thinking the other day that I can't really imagine doing science like without preprints, just because they let you get your data out there so early and like it helps with data visibility and sort of all of that. I can't imagine doing it without preprinting first. How, how does, I can ask different questions. So how does Prachi go about that in her lab? Is she very clear up front that this is how science should be done? Or does she kind of deliberately recruit people who are the future of science that we want, not the people we don't <laughs> really want science? I assume those people don't listen, so I've not offended anyone there. <laughs> I think it's kind of a little mix of both. She's 
I mean, as you probably know, she's very open and honest and upfront about her beliefs about how science should be. And based on that, she's sort of like people that are interested in working with her are also sort of like open and upfront about their thoughts and they share a lot of the same ideals, um, or at least that's sort of how it's how it's worked out so far. Um, so I guess it's sort of a little bit of both. So did you before you joined the lab, did you had you preprinted before or were you aware of preprinting or was that something you were introduced to in the lab? I was aware of them. I like I read preprints. I hadn't preprinted anything before. Um, so she kind of helped me through the process of like posting a preprint and all of the good reasons why to post preprints and all of that. So yeah, it was sort of a new experience with her, but I had read preprints before. So I said at the start, amongst all the wonderful fun facts that Emma couldn't choose between, you moved cross country between in the middle of doing a PhD and a, a global pandemic. How was that? Because one of those things alone and moving is incredibly stressful, having also done both. How was that together? How did you stay sane during that, that whole process? <laughs> well, we actually found out that we were moving like right before the pandemic hit. It was like March 2020. Um, and so while we were working from home, we were sort of like gearing up for this move and everything. And we had, I mean, we, she, Prachi was great. She was like upfront with all of her options. Like you can come with me or whatever, like we'll make it work for you, whatever's best. And so I think she really helped make it easier on us. But we did have to end up like renting a place without ever even coming to this part of the country and like all of that. So there were things that were difficult. But I think working with Prachi and ev and every and everyone here made it a lot easier. Um, everyone at Dartmouth was like super welcoming. Um, and so even though we were in a pandemic, people would be like introduce themselves. And because um, by that point, everyone was kind of coming back into the lab and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, everyone was great. It was it wasn't as bad as it sounds <laughs> um, and it was actually kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, you kind of actually the timing might have been quite good because when you move a lab, you, you're down tools anyway and you'd already yeah. kind of done that. So you, you, it sounds like you got the move in in the bit where you probably wouldn't be able to do much anyway. <laughs> yeah, so actually, true, maybe, yeah. maybe quite good timing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we ask everyone to talk about things they think could be better in science and academia. Just because we like a good rant, last episode, linking the episodes, I'm doing great today, if I do say so <laughs> myself. Um, last episode, we talked a lot about how we like a good rant. That one was about postdocs. So one of the things you mentioned is, I think unsurprisingly, is around the, the open science aspect of things. Um, and you, you highlight bioarchive in particular, other preprint servers are available, even though we're not the BBC. So why is it you think that open science is so important for the future of academia science? Um, well, I guess in order for science to really move forward, you need to be kind of aware of what else is out there. And I think that's sort of like the traditional model of like hiding your data and like writing up a manuscript until you can publish it somewhere. I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about it. I think it's important to get your data sort of out there and available earlier um, so that people that are maybe studying something similar have access to it and can use it to kind of drive their own research um, and, you know, produce their own data. Um, I just think like the cycle of like data production and, and science and everything can be a lot more efficient if things are available early on and just available in general. Like I hate when you're looking for a paper and you get to a paywall or something. That's the worst. Um, about, about 10 clicks in as well at this point yeah. to try and actually get to the point of being told you yeah, can't read you're like paper. looking looking for a method and you're like in this paper but in this paper and then like three papers later <laughs> paywall <laughs> yeah. I, I'm surprised I've done that so there's a PhD when I was doing my PhD there was a paper I needed that was from I think it was 1954 and it was behind a paywall and it was a two-page paper because I had to get it through, on <laughs> physically get it through the library and like what who's paying to read that these days yeah <laughs> for free um it's also really hard to find that paper's that old so one of the other things you mentioned back to postdocs and grad students is that the so it comes back to that kind of people in science doesn't really matter what level you're at work long hours um, we put a lot of effort in and we're not particularly well compensated now I'm saying that from a UK standpoint where as we talked at the beginning RPG, RPGs are three, three years long and then, then you're out whereas in America much longer I've also heard that the postdoc process in America is a lot tougher um, I think just generally the American working culture is more work, less have fun um, than it is in a lot of other places. So how, how is that in, in the US? How do you find being a grad student in terms of 
that balance? Yeah, this is also sort of an interesting question in terms of the pandemic, because I kind of had that in the middle of my PhD. So when I started my PhD, I was kind of one of those people that was like working all the time. Um, and I spent a lot of hours in the lab. I worked when I was at home, um, but then the pandemic hit and we kind of had to sort of, I mean, we the lab shut down, so we were working mostly from home. And so at first during that time, I had a really hard time separating like work-life balance um, because I was always at home. So I could always be like working on something. Um, but as the pandemic sort of went on, I realized that that wasn't like a healthy way to be doing science or anything. Um, so I started to kind of be more mindful about I'm going to work during these hours and then I'm going to be at home during these hours. And then when we got back into the lab, we started doing this thing where we like scheduled time in the lab and we could work two or three days a week and then we were at home the rest of the time. So I got really good at coming into the lab and like getting my stuff done in a really efficient way and then going home and analyzing it and stuff. Um, and so I've sort of carried that through now that we're back in the lab all the time. And so when I'm at work, I try to like really focus on my work and be efficient and get everything done as much as possible. But then and so that way, when I'm at home, I don't necessarily have to be like working all the time. But um, that really took me a lot of years to sort of get to that point. And so I think it's person dependent and it's also lab dependent, program dependent and all of that. Um, and I know in some places it, it is really bad. And then in some places, like you kind of have the opportunity to make it what you want. Um, yeah, I can't quite imagine you're able to do a lot of work when you're sat in a kayak. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably not conductive to having a laptop out. Not usually, no. With all the water around. <laughs> what you've just said is exactly what kind of I went through. Like during my first couple of years of my PhD, I worked like all the time, whatever hours, gave up loads of stuff. And it was just felt like it felt, I, I basically got quite, um, I was depressed and I, with a lot of anxiety and stuff. And now I'm, I had to make it. So I'm like, I come in at this time and I leave at this time. I'm the most efficient throughout. And I think, I, yeah, the pandemic helped a little bit with that. But it's, I think everyone needs to set their own boundaries and learn to set boundaries. But that's really difficult sometimes, yeah. like especially depending on what lab. So currently I'm in my other lab um, at the minute and they have a very different work culture to the one I used to be in. So I've split between two labs now and it's basically lots of people work all the time here. And then in my other lab, I can make it what I want. And it's been quite a quite a shock again coming back to that, <laughs> I have to say. Yeah, I just go the other way and just don't stop working. It's- I have not. I have not got. Well, this a is the thing. You need to set your own boundaries. Set your own. Boundaries. I know that I like. I work better if I have some time, that, like for me to recharge and stuff. So, yeah. it's actually. I mean, for me, it's it's kind of the best to set boundaries and take some time for me. Yeah. That, that's why yeah. I tell everyone. I can like, I always tell people to stop. We've got students, and <laughs> that I keep telling them to go home. We had, yeah. a, we had a really we had a 13 and a half hour day yesterday just because we were teaching and learning new stuff so it's always as emma said always takes longer and yeah it ended up being a really long day and that's quite a good lesson for people listening and how to and learning to, to balance and spending time to get that balance right because it does take a lot of effort it's not i think it's a conscious thing you've got to do you've got to actively uncouple okay um so ending on something a bit lighter than all of that so one thing, one of the other things you said that you, you quite like is when science papers have something that is containing a, a strange organism in it, um, which is probably not too much of a surprise working with Prachi again. Uh, <laughs> but what is your favorite sort of paper or strange organism that you've seen? And why is it strange? So I don't know if this is like a great answer, but I told you before that I'm really interested in actin regulation and that sort of thing. So I love reading papers about like, parasites like plasmodium and giardia that have like super weird actins and then like people sort of trying to figure out why their actins are so weird what their actins are doing what their actins are interacting with and that sort of thing those are like my favorite papers i try to cite them whenever i can and like i'm writing my thesis right now i have like a whole section on divergent actins and organisms and stuff um so yeah i love those kinds of papers (laughs) there you go see nice happy ending there i think (laughs) i think i think that is it and that was great I was obviously super interested because I, I, I didn't stop asking questions. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I normally stop, so thank you for that. Yeah, it was yeah. really nice to meet you guys. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you as well. Have a good day. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week.